everyone. This is Gilbert Jalad. I'm talking to you here from CPLS headquarters in downtown. This is Tufts on Tax, where all your tax uh, questions and answers are here with Mr. T. Scott Tufts. He is the master and the expert when it comes to tax law. Any trouble you are having with taxes regarding uh, lawsuits, trouble with employers, businesses, friends, and family, even with the IRS. Your peace of mind here, right here with Mr. T. Scott Tufts, he is the he is the expert. So, guys, folks, do not hesitate to ask ask the expert here uh, when it comes to tax law. You want the expert to answer your questions. Don't ignore that. Don't let yourself, uh, you know, have other people handle it. Let the expert handle these problems. And uh, we are back today with a with a special uh, episode with a special guest. We have Hallie Zobel today. Uh, she's a state planning and probate uh, uh, lawyer attorney. Uh, so we are going to ask her a few questions about tax law and how does does it impact her practice? Hello, Scott. How are you? We are back. <laughs> Good to be with you, Gilbert. <laughs> Good to be with you, too, uh, as always. And uh, I don't want to uh, talk too much about uh, uh, the interview today, but we are interviewing a special guest. Yeah, we as in this segment, uh, Gilbert, we try and get uh, into the practice areas of others see how tax impacts them, and then give a chance to uh, learn from them and, and I help our audience get to know them and uh, see how taxes impact what they do. Yes, absolutely. And I bet it's going to be a very interesting episode. So we'll uh, go and right back with uh, Miss Hallie Zobel. All right. Well, I'm honored today to have with me a colleague, uh, Hallie Zobel probate and estate planning attorney, uh, someone I've gotten to know uh, recently. Um, welcome, Hallie. Thank you. Yeah, so it's uh, awesome to get a chance to talk to someone and uh, like yourself. Um, I've looked at uh, some of your background and what fascinated me was you um, have worked with clients, with families with special needs, singles, young families with small children, same-sex couples, families, and seniors with uh, end-of-life issues. And um, it's a chance for us to talk a little bit about it. Why don't you take a moment, Hallie, and talk about how you ended up being a state planning attorney. Okay. Um, I was a criminal defense attorney and had a very bad day in court and decided I would make a change. I was scheduled to go in front of a very tough judge. My client had both physical and mental disabilities, and he was bringing a video camera into the courtroom, and I had visions of the judge tossing him into jail and he announced he was going to video his entire trial. That case ended up getting rescheduled to another day and I walked out the courtroom and said I had had enough and I was going to move to a new area of law, a kinder, gentler law. How about that? So um, interestingly enough, so you 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 got in a, a moment there where you looked at capacity issues, right? And and us lawyers, we, we worry about our clients that have diminished capacity or they're vulnerable or other such things. Uh, um, talk a little bit about what that's how that's gone since that time, since you've gotten into this area of the law. Well, I think every attorney has to be concerned about capacity, no matter what age their client is. The client could be suffering from mental illness, and um, you must always be aware and on the lookout for those issues. So it's not necessarily the elderly, but with the elderly comes a whole new set of problems where they truly could be having organic uh, brain issues going on and things going on because of their age and the uh, aging of the brain. And you have to be real careful and make decisions of whether or not you believe they have capacity. Interesting. So one of the things that occurred to me recently is, you know, in this era where we, we Zoom and we talk electronically, um, can you talk a little bit about how important it is from your vantage point to talk to clients in person versus what you see over the phone. I, you know, I think about prosecutors and concerns folks have about seeing body language or seeing these. How are you adjusting to that where you're and how are you meeting with clients uh, in, the, in the world that we're in today? Well, with the older clients, I almost require it to be in person and not by Zoom. Don't the experts say 80% of what we, 90% of how we communicate is through body. Mm -hmm. And so you lose a lot of that with the uh, Zoom 
um, video, I think. So I definitely like to be in the room when it's an elderly client so I can evaluate and make determinations of if they're following my conversation or with their eyes, if they're tracking me or whatever it may be. See, that's awesome. So um, one of the things I noticed in here that um, struck me, and maybe it's just because Hallie, what we do on Tufts on Tax is we, we try and look at uh, some of the forms and taxes that um, can lead to surprises for folks, you know, litigation and whatnot. And I noticed that uh, you volunteered at one time in a local nursing home and your bio, and it got me thinking a little bit about um, – caregivers in the home and 1099s an independent contractor and and uh how when they come into your home maybe they're almost uh schedule h employees as as it were and and they and maybe 1099 isn't the way to go or cash under the table any any quick thoughts about that well i have personal experience of that about eight nine years ago when my mother was sick and brought in um caregivers to help uh, with her and we followed we went to the CPA and my parents and I and followed their advice and recommendations when making those determinations how the that help was going to be classified see that's awesome too because one of the things we're trying to get the word out is yeah you can go get someone to do a tax form or you can hit a button and it might get electronically done but with so many questions on these tax forms so much detail so much data gathering in all these forms uh, kind of important to get to a competent, qualified accountant, right? So one that uh, is a professional. And you see that in your practice as well? Absolutely. And the CPA was so invaluable with us because he also advised us of what type of um, medical care could be used when we needed um, deductions come mm -hmm. tax time. And he was right there along with us as we were making those expenses of what could be used and what couldn't be used. So it was very helpful as we navigated through that. Awesome. So working hand in hand and with the accountants and, and, um, and with the clients and their accountants, correct? Yes. Awesome. And a family dynamic, right? You know, I, I know that we, we've dealt with, um, LLCs and family entities and so forth. So your estate planning can involve family business. And then when that happens, uh, you can get in all these business and these initials and everything, right? It does. Um, but I understand a lot of the basics of that. But then if it gets too complicated, I'll, I'll turn it over <laughs> to my tax attorney, Buddy Scott. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, so one of the things we talk about, you know, we're big here on Tufts on Tax. We're talking about K-1s and 1099s and, and, um, and K-1s that come out of trusts and estates and, um, and then how they can lead to litigation if they're not addressed, uh, promptly. But one of the things that I'm shocked that I, I don't see as much on that I, maybe you could touch on is, you know, the revocable trust that avoids probate. Um, I'm seeing more and more situations where the grantor, is no longer the trustee, right? So you have a revocable trust, the person hasn't passed away, um, but the successor trustee has stepped in. And one of the things that I, I was just kind of shocked by is how many practitioners and people did not know how to kind of monitor that separation between the grantor becoming a beneficiary and the successor trustee and a revocable situation. Any comments about how that starts to unfold before death? That's a great question, Scott, and it has many um, um, complex issues kind of tucked into it. So first of all, the grantor is no longer serving as trustee, and it's usually because they're incapacitated. And our trust, we draft specifically to say, what is the definition of incapacitation? definition of incapacity and when can the grantor no longer serve. So yes, a successor or next in line trustee then begins to serve and it becomes the statute still not very clear. And even between we practitioners, we argue about whether at that point the trust has become irrevocable mm -hmm. uh, because it could be that the agent under power of attorney could make changes to the trust if the trust is allowed <laughs> to do that. So successor trustee, you're still, the taxes are still going to be taxed under the grantor's social security number, but it causes a duty does, and the trustee's going to need to know, do you need to notify the qualified beneficiaries of this? Who is your duty to? Your duty is to the grantor as trustee. See, that's awesome because um, in the arcane world of, um, 
of LLCs and, and, you know, and you, you might have a small number of owners in a LLC of members. Um, but if the membership interest gets put into a revocable trust, it suddenly changes how that entity gets audited. And many folks don't know that. So for example, if we looked at the K1 out of a, a three person LLC and one of the interests is in a revocable trust, it's technically the situation where the the member is the revocable trust by title. And then that technically creates a, what we call a BBA partnership, the old Tefra partnership, which then creates the complexity of having to use a particular person to handle the audit of the entity. It used to be tax matters partner. Now it's called a partnership representative. And I think how many people know that? People don't know that. And it sounds like the CPAs and the drafters of the business documents need to communicate with the estate planning attorneys. hundred percent. And I think that's uh, so much of a collaboration that needs to happen more, right? Than, yes. than it maybe does. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk with you about is, um, you know, Hallie, we want to see situations where the tax issues come up and maybe they're not resolved. Um, one of the things that comes up is the foreign bank accounts. So you have more and more clients that have international travels. Maybe they have international dealings or families from out of the country. Um, can they walk into or inherit these international situations? And then how do you, how do you deal with that? So for example, I think of the example where, um, maybe the matriarch or patriarch of a family has a, a lot of money overseas and then it gets passed on well the children or even the matriarch or patriarch if they're here have to report that and then that can add substantially to what is an estate tax right so just touch on briefly how when you do the probates situations or um after death that it's what the worldwide assets right that you look at it's not just that which is here that's right? correct and living here in orlando we are just a smorgasbord of international persons people from all over the world live here or own property here so a lot of times it's divvying up and figuring out what are the assets here what are the assets overseas um the benefit or even living in another state, whether that beneficiary is going to have to pay taxes or inheritance taxes, which our state doesn't have. So when we look at a beneficiary overseas, it could become quite complicated. I certainly am not well versed on what the law may be in another country. So I advise them that they've got to get their own advisors, their own CPAs, because I technically don't represent the beneficiaries. My job is to represent the um, personal representative and make sure he or she does everything within the um, bounds of the law. But I haven't had too many of those cases right. where um, we've had foreign beneficiaries. Um, obviously, I can't handle probates out of the state or out of the country, but I've not had many come across um, my desk. So uh, one thing maybe great for our listeners to know, um, if they have a will from another state, and then they come here and don't update that will. Now we want them to, but if they pass away, it can be probated here. It's just the concern whether it's been properly adhering to maybe Florida law. Is that the right thinking? Absolutely. The will must be authenticated. I have three or four of them going on now. One will out of Tennessee, one will out of Maryland, another will out of North Carolina. And these people move to our state, but don't have it reviewed by a Florida attorney. And if there's any takeaway today on interstate movement and takeaway from the listeners, we want them to have the will checked out and reviewed by a Florida attorney. If it complies with Florida law, I'll tell them that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have them get a new will if they don't need it. But so many times the wills are drafted differently, 50 different states, 50 different set of rules, and it does not comply with Florida law, and then we have to jump through additional hoops, which means more expense to you listeners out there to get the will admitted to court. And that gets me kind of maybe to the final point we can cover today, which is, you know, Hallie, what happens when a daughter or a son comes to you and wants to help their mother or father get the estate planning done? Um, they come to you, they hi they're essentially hiring you, but they're really not your client. Um, and then maybe there's children in other states, you know, and siblings. How do you handle those dynamics to make sure that uh, the planning you're doing is acutely for the 
the mother or father or for the child if if they've got the issues what what happens that's a great question and it happens more frequently than not you'd be surprised i make it very clear from the onset who the client is i immediately kick out all family members from the conference room not necessarily popular with the children but i have candid conversations with the person to make sure this is what their desires are. There's case law out there and we attorney geeks talk about the case law, but the reality is if you're a layperson out there, you even something as little as driving your elderly father to the attorney's office could be considered um, influencing your elderly father. Setting up the appointment could be considered influencing your father. Uh, using your attorney instead of selecting an attorney for your father, letting him selecting. All these are indicators of possible undue influence. It's interesting because I know some states don't have an aggressive posturing of statutes to protect the elderly from exploitation. Florida, of course, pretty robust protections for our elderly. A quick comment about that? Just uh, in the last couple years, there's been new legislation passed uh, involving in actually being able to get injunctions in joining people from hassling or stalking or exploiting elderly people. And that can go hand in hand with the guardianship, which is my area of practice generally when someone doesn't have advanced directives. But Florida has done a really good job. In fact, Florida prosecution offices now, they even have um, elderly elderly divisions, which they didn't have when I was a prosecutor 25, <laughs> 30 years ago. So because of the aging population of our state, we've really, uh, our legislation has really turned a bright light on that. And I'm pleased that these new laws have come into effect. So in, in a parting way, what kind of things can you tell our listeners to uh, any rules of thumb about how to get the their elderly mother or father or parent or or concerned friend uh, directly to the help? Um, is it that they can bring them, but they need to kind of be prepared to exit? Is it a uh, uh, what what kind of uh, rules are you developing in your mind about how to get to the attorney uh, for the estate planning? I don't. That's a great question. I don't, many times I'll tell the client, I need someone to bring you to the office other than a family member. And I lay that expectation out and make them find someone else. I'll say, okay, a family member can drive you. I'll speak to the elderly person on the phone myself prior to the family member or children coming in. And I set the expectations very clearly and let them know that they will not be allowed to sit in the conference. And I'm very serious about that because um, because of the ethicalness of it. And I also have a pamphlet from the American Bar Association that explains to people why they can't sit in the conference room. You know, and the, maybe the last piece of this would be so you would expect the elderly person to be able to talk about their assets, right? They, to go through the questionnaire or the intake, as it were. And if they Absolutely. can't do that with you, that's going to be a warning sign, right? That they, they don't know what they have. Sign. We lawyers learned in our decedents of states and trust class way back when that the person needs to know about the bounties of their objects and what assets they have. Mm-hmm. So that's awesome. So, um, you know, in, we can't cover everything that you do, Hallie, but in terms of taxes, any kind of things that um, I know you mentioned that that if an issue comes up, you can kind of obviously know when the CPA or, or someone like myself can come in if something's going awry. Um, but any quick thought about your expectations or uh, about the estate tax? You know, you folks will talk about that and they worry about that. Any Any crystal ball or thoughts you have about the estate tax? Not really. I had clients in this afternoon just before um, uh, sitting down for this talk, and their wealth was such that something they really didn't need to worry about the estate tax. I've attended one or two seminars, as, as you yourself have, and no one really knows what Congress is going to do. But we need to be uh, vigilant and on top of the new law and know what's coming down the pike. But for now, um, there is no Uh, legislation from my understanding that's going to change the estate tax exemption amount. For now, maybe we need to look more into capital gains tax and pending legislation as it affects capital gains and things of that nature. Yeah. And and, and again, 
this will be the last question. Uh, gift tax. Talk a little bit about the annual exclusion kind of amount. I think the old days it was 10000 but just talk a little bit about why that number is important, you know, for what folks give each year to a particular person compared to why it matters if this estate tax is so large. What, what's, what do you do if you make a gift of more than whatever you're allowed to do? Well, what the average person doesn't realize, Scott, is that they are supposed to file a gift tax return anytime they gift a certain amount of money, even if there's not a tax that needs to be uh, paid. And the average person doesn't realize that. Is the gift tax exclusion amount, is it 15000 this year? Yeah, it's like gone up, right? So I'm not, not sure, but you're allowed to gift that in addition to that in addition to gifting your lifetime amount. So it's important to keep records on that because when you notify the IRS, and this is more your area, that sets up a statute of limitations, if I'm correct. Right. So you can uh, show that very clearly to the IRS that these gifts were given and if there's any problem later on. You know, in the last part of this and some of this litigation that uh, we get into the questions of their gift tax returns or declaring that they made a gift versus something else in a family dynamic with guardianships and fighting going on and whether gifts were made or they were loans or whatever, all that's going to be part of that dynamic to record properly what, what families are doing, right, in their interactions. Absolutely. So the takeaway is see the CPA file the gift tax return. That's awesome. And uh, talk about digital records for a minute. How do they come up? Digital records don't come up too often, um, at least with my older clients. The younger clients, I think, are dabbling into it and um, and considering um, the cryptocurrency and things of that nature, but really not so much with my older clients. And talk about crypto. What's uh, what are you seeing? What do you what are you starting to worry about in estate planning? Well. The valuations of these uh, bitcoins and how do we make the valuations when we have to show to the court an inventory and what the values are. So what? why is it difficult? I mean, let's take our listeners who are not aware of that. Uh, they're new to it or something. What do you start to ask them or what, what are you doing now? Well, I'm working with the CPAs on this to to guide me and guidance to see so we can come up with valuations because as a fiduciary, the personal representative or executive has a duty to let the court know what is in the estate and likewise let the beneficiaries know this is what's in the estate. And are they capturing a date of death? It seems to me... Can I? Isn't isn't it just as simple as okay? Uh, at date of death, we we have a marker and a time to value it, or is it that it's changing so quickly that is it literally the down to the second of when you die, or what what's going on with that? These are great questions, and the the legislation hasn't been passed yet and caught up with our very old antiquated laws, and as of now, it's date of death, but it's it's a myriad of. Um, of problems. Interesting. And, you know, our listeners know from Tufts on Tax that the 1040 tax form has a yes, no question on it now, Holly, that says, are you, are you not trading in, in the virtual currency, which is, you know, Bitcoin. And my concern is, is that that yes, no, you, you check no and you're, and you've got Bitcoin going on, then that can expose you to criminal. No different than the yes, no box for uh, the foreign bank account signature authority. So we're trying to get the word out that, that you've got to answer yes on that box. But that then reminds us all that the IRS is gathering that data, trying to figure out what they're going to do with with regard to the um, taxation of it. And so what you're telling me is on the probate side, that's happening as well, that yes. that's a developing situation. Um and any other comments? You know, anything else that's developing in your practice that is kind of cutting edge or things that are happening that uh, you want our listeners to know about? Nothing much cutting edge, but I want the listeners to know about uh, what the duties of a fiduciary relationship are. And when you're appointed trustee or personal representative, Florida uses the term personal representative, uh, that word fiduciary is a very high duty. It comes from the Latin term fiducia, which means trust. And the person holds a legal or ethical duty to someone other than themselves in relationship and hold 
holding assets. So it's a very high uh, duty, and we want to make sure our clients do what they're supposed to do and follow within the. I've heard it said that even one dollar can't be put in the pocket of a trustee. Is that is it that literal or what? You know, <laughs> You've heard what? That it's even a, you know they can't even take a dollar, right? That they oh, have the that, highest that's right. of honor, and that that that's uh, they're not supposed to even do that. Is that that's the correct. kind of right idea? That's correct. Okay, and you know, and um, I think it's a big burden, right, to make sure that. Um, they adhere to that fiduciary duty. Absolutely. Signing tax returns would be to make sure they get the best advice to do that. Likewise. So well, Hallie, this has been awesome. And, you know, in going forward, what um, we at Tufts on Tax are trying to do is, like I said, get the word out on the um, taxes. You know, we've got cryptocurrency. We've got digital records to be talking about. We've got so much. And I look forward to a chance to talk about some of that as uh, things develop and bringing you back. If, if you would come back, we would like that very much. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for having me on your show. I'm, it's an honor to be here, and hopefully the clients, that, excuse me, the uh, listeners will have some takeaways today. Well, if you want to get some estate planning and probate questions answered, certainly uh, reach out to Hallie here at CPLS. You can call and reach her at 407-647-7887. Ask for Hallie. Uh, she is... Uh, you know, certainly well positioned, very much qualified to answer your questions. And we look forward to uh, talking to you again on Tufts on Tax. This interview was uh, wonderful. Uh, what do you think, uh, Scott? Yeah, I think it was excellent. A uh, great chance for us to talk with Hallie, get to know her practice, and uh, look forward to her talk. Look forward to talking to her again. Yes, and and, uh, and other attorneys. Uh, yeah, from we'll, CPLS in this there. segment, it's a chance to break from the monotony of tax. Uh, tax touches everything, and it gives us a chance to talk to some folks who do other things and see how tax interacts with what they do. Absolutely. There you go, folks. If you have any questions, uh, any lawsuits you are experiencing, please don't hesitate to call the expert here, Mr. T. Scott Tufts. He will help you. He is uh, an expert in this uh, practice. Uh, any tax law issues, call 877-647-7887. Again, that number is 877-647-7887. If you're watching our YouTube channel, it will be on the screen. You can also email him at stufts at cplspa.com. Again, that S-T-U-F-T at cplspa.com. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.